Candy O is a name just about everybody recognizes in the Boston area. Honored by her peers in 2015 as Broadcaster of the Year, she spent 25 years on Magic 106.7, connecting with listeners in an authentic, memorable way. Candy is also an accomplished singer, actress, voiceover, pro, and master interviewer. The president and co-founder of Boston Women in Media, which by the way we're partnering with this morning, she's the creator of Exceptional Women Brand and the story behind her success live. Um, it's an interview series. So Candy is the recipient of over 45 local and national awards for excellence in women's programming. She can now add high-level media training to her list of talents, having recently been tapped by the former WCVB-TV anchor Liz Bruna as an executive coach with Bruna Communications. She was born in New York City, raised in Connecticut, and she came to Boston to swim and dive at Boston College. She and her husband, Tom, live in Wellesley Hills with their Brady Bunch family of five grown children and are still expected to show, to show up for Sunday dinner. With that, Candy, here you go. I'm trying to think of the last time all five kids showed up for Sunday dinner. I have to think about that for a second. Good morning. Thank you so very much, everyone, for being here this morning. It is absolutely my pleasure to moderate this panel and to work with the Harvard Square Business Association and collaborate as well with Boston Women in Media and Entertainment to celebrate National Women's History Month. We have two insightful panels. The first will be focused on the arts, the second on politics and policy right here in Cambridge. Boston Women in Media and Entertainment is a trade organization founded in 2012 by Dela Arabella Centuri and me. Dela is here. Will you please raise your hand, Dela, so everybody can see you. She is standing right beside our Red Sox raffle tickets, and she'd love to sell you some. We have just been so delighted to be able, for the first time, to be able to create a scholarship fund for our members. We encourage you to, uh, to, to get a raffle ticket because that's where the money will go. We were originally founded in 2001 as the New England chapter of American Women in Radio and Television. We decided to sort of take a page out of the history book and break away on our own so that we could support women in media and entertainment right here in our own backyard. A gentle reminder, everybody, and I'll give you 10 seconds. Could you please silence your cell phones or put them on vibrate? And thank you so much for that. Before I invite our first three panelists to the stage, I wanted to take a moment to frame this morning's conversations with a very quick little story. Over the course of my broadcasting career, I have had the incredible opportunity to interview over 600 women for the show that was just mentioned, Exceptional Women on Magic 106.7. And the idea for the show was really simple. Find a woman doing great things with her life, invite her to come into the studio, ask her a few really thoughtful, insightful questions, and then sit back and let her shine. It was the best idea I ever had. These exceptional women taught me and our listeners about courage, perseverance, strength, purpose, entrepreneurship, humility, human kindness, integrity, and mostly they taught me what success really means, and they blaze a trail wherever they go. So a few months ago, I was feeling kind of pensive, and I decided to sit down and try to remember the lessons that they had taught me. And I came up with 16 life lessons I've learned from interviewing exceptional women. And here they are. Number one, wake up grateful. Number two, baby steps are better than no steps at all. Number three, it's not what happens to you in life, it's how you handle it. Number four, obstacles are opportunities. Number five, trust your intuition, that little voice inside your head. Courage is when you leap. Faith is when you believe you will land on your feet. Number seven, adjust your compass, but don't quit. Number eight, there is great joy in striving toward your potential. Number nine, don't just show up, stand out. Number 10, Success is a conscious decision. See it, feel it, imagine it, 
and believe that you can achieve it. Number 11, lead with purpose and compassion. Number 12, my father's favorite, stay humble no matter what you do. Number 13, good goes around, even if it takes a while. Number 14, relationships are everything. Number 15, wisdom is recognizing a mistake before you make it again. And finally, number 16, at the end of the day, ask yourself this one question as you lay your head down on the pillow. Is this a day I can sign my name to? I'm sure you'll agree, whether you are male or female, these 16 life lessons will last a lifetime. Thank you. So, framed by those 16 life lessons, let's get the conversation started. Please welcome our exceptional panelists. First up, it's Georgia Lyman. She has been a lifelong participant in the performing arts. Born and raised in Boston, she is an award-winning actor who stumbled into producing. And you better believe I'm gonna ask her all about how that happened. Come on up. She likes to break the rules and color outside the lines to create atmospheric performance experiences that leave audiences inspired and wanting more. It's no wonder then that this woman who thinks outside the box is the artistic director for Outside the Box, Boston's largest interdisciplinary outdoor performing arts festival. She was recently named the artistic director of TEDx Cambridge. And while balancing all of this and two children, she is also acting next month in Maura Buffini's Gabriel at the Stoneham Theater. Please welcome Georgia Lyman. <laughs> And our next panelist is the director of Harvard University's American Repertory Theater, Diane Quinn. Diane is a graduate of the University of Toronto's Honors Arts Specialist Program with a concentration in arts management and drama. She rose through the ranks at Cirque du Soleil, where she started as a public service director and then rose to become Senior Vice President of Creative and Artistic Operations managing the quality of the show worldwide. She is the founding producer of the Soul Pepper Theatre Company and the executive director of Toronto Women in Film and Television. Please join me in welcoming Diane Quinn. Our final panelist is Sarah Stackhouse. She's the chair of theater at Boston Conservatory at Berkeley, and that's not all. Sarah is also the founder of her own creative services company, Stackhouse Creative. She's the recipient of many awards for excellence in her field. Sarah is currently the board chair for Mass Creative and is developing a cross-cultural project between women from Boston and women from South Africa. It's called the Mama Project. Long before we began binge-watching HGTV, Sarah worked as the supervising producer of Inside This Old House for the A&E Television Network and as associate producer on eight films, including Yo-Yo Ma, inspired by Bach. She's also ventured into radio, having worked for NPR and collaborated on projects with Rounder Records. Somehow, this exceptional woman finds time for her husband and her two children. Please welcome Sarah Stackhouse. Okay, ladies, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much. We've got a beautiful, sunshiny day. And I want to just remind you that if you can, keep your answers to about two or three minutes. I might give you the wrap it up sign if you're going on a little bit too long, because we want to make sure we get you back to work on time this morning. I wanted to start out by asking you each one individual question, and then the rest of the questions we can all answer together. Georgia. How does one stumble into producing? <laughs> Answer that for us. Tell us that story. Sure. Um, I had a. Um, I was part of a um, communal theater group, which is different than community theater. Um, it was a communally run professional theater project called Orfeo Group that um, I and five of my friends put together, and. Um, we had done a couple shows and we opted next to produce uh, a show called The Complete Works of William Shakespeare, which is a cast of three gentlemen 
Um, so somebody had to actually make it go. <laughs> um, and so I said, well, sure, I've never produced anything like this before, but I'll give it a shot. And um, I learned that, um, well, I learned quite a good deal. But uh, the show was a success. We had a wonderful run out at the um, Christian Herder Park, which hopefully is mm -hmm. stemming back up again, which I'm very excited about. We were the last people to, to work there. And um, I and my co-producer put together this <laughs> incredibly bizarre, hysterical, a uh, wonderful piece that um, continued on in various locations after that because people just wanted to keep have it keep coming back. So it was completely by accident and because someone had to do it, which is, I think, how many jobs start. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Diane, managing the artistic quality of Cirque du Soleil worldwide. Now that sounds like a job. I don't know what you guys think, but that sounds like a job for Wonder Woman. So what talents did you use to do the job and what did you have to learn? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I probably had to learn more than anything else. It was about, that's my Canadian coming through, about, uh, <laughs> it was about time management more than anything else. You had to realize that in the moment that you were in another country looking at a show to give feedback on a performance, you were only going to be there for two or three days. You had to decide what was the most important items or items that you're going to give feedback to those performers would be. And that was probably the, the most important thing because you really started to, to look at the bigger picture and instead of trying to deal with you know, fixing every small piece of a show, you had to decide what would be the most important aspect for the audiences that were going to be there. Uh, and I don't know, I, I don't know if you plan for a job like that. Yeah. It was more about being open and willing to the possibility of, of traveling uh, almost exclusively. You know, you were home very infrequently. And uh, just being open to the experience of, of um, sort of putting your, your hands in, in the fate, so to speak, and, and traveling wherever the artists were going to be and, and dealing with the issues that would come up. I mean, sometimes you'd go to a show and it was perfect. And you'd think, oh, do I really want to actually quibble about something that was incredibly small after an audience had stood up for a five-minute standing ovation? And some days you had to decide, yes, actually the performance was lousy, even though people were standing up and giving a, a rousing standing ovation. And that's probably the most difficult thing, was to give artists feedback when they thought they had done a great job. And you had to actually go in and say, you didn't quite hold that uh, contortion pose quite long <laughs> enough or something to that effect. So it's about making choices and deciding what's important to give feedback on. That sounds like when I get off the air and I think I've had a great show and my boss hauls me into his office and tells me how much I sucked. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay, um, Sarah, please tell us about the Mama Project. Oh, the Mama Project. So my husband's grandmother grew up in Cape Town and when she died, uh, my husband's parents said, can you please come with us back to Cape Town because we want to take the ashes back to the garden of the house that she grew up in. But it's like really complicated to take ashes on an airplane. So she just put some in a baggie <laughs> and put it in her purse. And we went to Cape Town. And um, we did some family things. We visited relatives and we went and saw incredible wildlife and um, we went to the house where she grew up and knocked on the door and then said, can we look around your garden? And then we like, <laughs> like shook out grandma and, um, and did a little sort of secret thing. Um, but while we were there, a friend of mine was working in one of the townships called Kailicha and she said, um, why don't you guys come visit? My husband is a pediatric physical therapist. So we went and visited and we did a couple days of volunteering and it was like, an incredible moment for us. And we came back, and this ties to what you were saying, we came back, we we're like washing dishes in our kitchen in Arlington. And my husband said, well, you know, maybe after our kids graduate from college, we should go volunteer. And I said, well, what if we just went now? <laughs> and so we did, we actually like rented our house and pulled our kids out of school. And I worked for Actor Shakespeare Project over Skype and like we just went. Um, we spent a year there, and the whole year was really about my husband's work, but our whole family was in it. And I started dreaming up this project with the women that I met, all of whom are mamas, and their job title is mama at the orphanage. They're hired as mamas, like that's their job. So um, they don't get to create much or make much. So this summer I'm taking seven artists from here 
I'm working with a bunch of those mamas there and we're going to get together for two weeks and tell stories and share recipes and sing and talk about our lives and uh, do like an exhibit at the end. Wow. What an incredible project. Congratulations on that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, now the rest of our questions are going to be for all of you. So jump in if you feel inspired and you think you've got an answer for us. What is it about your career in the arts that makes your heart sing? What is it that keeps you going? What is it that inspires you about being in the arts? Because I can imagine that there are, you know, there's the whole rule of, you know, don't quit your day job. We don't know how well this is going to go. So there must be so Sound much like my parents. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Applause. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're a slave to applause, right, Georgia? <laughs> Tell me, Diane. It, it was funny. I, I was actually thinking about this the other day because, you know, often we have students coming through the ART and, and, and they're, they're looking for inspiration or they're deciding what they're going to do with, with their careers. And, you know, I was, uh, as one of the students was leaving, I was thinking, what is it about being in the theater that's so incredible? And I think for me it's the fact that you could be reading a script one day, so something very two-dimensional, And then within three weeks, or four weeks, or two years, or three years, or however long it it, it takes for that script to make it to the stage, suddenly that piece of paper, this very two-dimensional thing, has this three-dimensional, full-blown life to it. You know, that these incredible actors, these artists, take the words on the stage, and then when you come to see the work, it's real. It is it takes you away from everything that you're doing maybe that day or maybe it brings it all back to you. But earlier that day or or three weeks earlier, it was just simply words on a page. And I think that that's quite extraordinary. It takes imagination and guts um, and creativity and problem solving. And we don't get, artists don't get enough credit for that, I think. Yeah. In many professions, success comes from following the rules. But in the arts, you're supposed to color outside the lines. Tell us about that, because there's so much risk-taking involved. You have to be brave. I mean, I think for me, the thing is that you have to, you have to go deep in your craft and your training to know the rules and be really good at working within them, and then you use them to break out. Mm-hmm. I think there's this sort of misconception that you just go and take risks and be messy without any foundation, or that it's all just foundational training. Like I, uh, I, I guess I really think you have to be a, a specialist, and then you have to be a generalist and break out and connect to everybody else. What you, um, that's, yeah, that's yeah. why. What do you think, Georgia? Because you know, if you're going to run outside the box, you got to answer this question for me. <laughs> that's actually. <laughs> That's always been my worst fear, is that the headlines will say nothing outside the box at this festival. Um, uh, I don't know. I think um, when, I, when I put together a, a, an event or a, a happening or whatever, I, I like to try and um, keep the unexpected as not just possible, but a reality. Um, that you know that you're coming to see something wonderful, but you may not always understand what it is. Um, and for me, that doesn't always mean that you're going to like it. I don't believe that um, art should leave people all in the same place. I don't think that everyone should come away thinking that was the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. I, all I care about is that you're talking about it when you leave. And that's what's most exciting to me is when I know I've done a good job when people walk away talking about it, no matter what it is. I want to move on to obstacles, because I do believe that obstacles are opportunities. Can you talk about an obstacle in your career that you had to find a way to get around? Anybody? Well, since it is uh, Women's History Month, I'll I'll talk about being on the board of directors for uh, for Cirque du Soleil. Um, I was one of two women on the board of about 27, and that's changing and I'm very glad about that and it's changing at Cirque and I'm, I'm hopeful that it will change everywhere. I think there was something recently in, in the Globe about this. And I would say the obstacle there is how do you as, um, uh, as a female, as a woman, make yourself heard and 
do it in a way that's still authentic to who you are. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you end up not being authentic, whether you're sitting around a, a board table or you're sitting around any kind of staff meeting or wherever you might be, it's still incredibly important for you to be who you are and be authentic. Yet at the same time, you have to find a way to break through and you have to find a way to be heard. And I would say that's probably a, a barrier that a lot of us deal with on a regular basis, again, no matter what the meeting or the interaction might be. And so I think for the challenge for me is how do I continue to be the authentic person that I was when I started at the organization? Um, and even though moving up through the ranks, that I was still the same person at that board meeting. And I remember one of the little tricks that I would do is I would sort of, I would bang my knee under the table a little bit to give myself a little bit of extra courage. Um, and, uh, and then I would just sort of launch in. And at the beginning of those board meetings, I wouldn't say much. And then I got a little more confident and uh, decided which jokes I might laugh at. And I think I laughed at less of the jokes after a while <laughs> that were being told around the table. But I really, I just, I had to kind of give myself a little extra courage and still be authentic at the same time. We hear about actresses being paid less than actors. Does inequity exist at this moment in the arts? I'm thinking about the incredible film, Hidden Figures, and the, fe the black female stars being told, oh no, you can't play a lead, and we can't win at the box office. Tell me what your thoughts are on all this. I think there's uh, a definite imbalance. Um, and, you know, yeah, you're starting to hear more actresses speak up about it like Robin Wright um, uh, and you know even um, what's her name the Hunger Games woman uh, Jennifer Lawrence yes. is, is starting to speak up about uh, you know and <laughs> what's ironic is that they're getting paid more than any of us will ever see in our entire lives <laughs> but um, but they're still speaking up about it and sometimes that's where it has to start is at the top so that everybody else can have the courage to say well if they can do it I might as well speak up for myself I think there is a little iniquity but I think that um, the more of us are willing, the more of us who are willing to speak up about it, even at the slightest level, um, the easier it will become to, the easier it will be to be overcome. Thank you. Yes, Susan. I, uh, it's, it's, it is, a, it is a, a pay issue, but I actually think it's a power issue. Have you guys seen the meme that's been going around social media of the huge room in Washington of white men deciding women's health care policy? Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's an issue of, um, like who are the producers and who are the people ch doing casting and who are the people on boards and so there there's a kind of even if you see people on stage who are looking more and more like us um, often when you go into the rooms of the power people above them it's a lot of white men not entirely but that is actually still where the power lies and so I think there has to be a shift not just out front but up top it's like that horrible gaffe that Matt Damon made when he was talking about diversity, and he, he insisted that diversity was just about um, uh, was about the casting of the film and not the actual production and crew of the film, <laughs> right. which is just not the case. It's on all levels. It's not just at one. Well, look, we've got we've got you know two black leads in our cast, so we're good. It's like yeah, but but who wrote it? Right. Uh, who's directing it? Is how is the, the crew? Table? Yeah, who's, who's at, the at the table actually mm -hmm. making these works? I, My I, fine, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to guess, I'm, I sort of jump in, that because the three of us are sitting here, we also have the opportunity to make sure that the people on our stages yes. are paid equally. And I'm going to hazard a guess that that is correct. Certainly mm -hmm. at the ART, that is correct. Yep. And I'm imagining that for you two ladies, it's correct yep. too. Finally, I will quote Shakespeare. Oh, when she's angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school. And though she be but little, she is fierce. As we celebrate the final days of Women's History Month 2017, in this chapter, hundreds of years post Shakespeare, take your own pulse. Are you fierce? Georgia? I'm not quite as fierce as I would like to be, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Diane? I think I get less fierce the older I get, but uh, I don't know. I, I made a change at my age, and he, I'm here in Boston, so I suppose I would have to say yes. Sarah? I think I'm f as fierce as I can be when I listen to the young people around me, <laughs> because they, they, they give you courage and fire. You have to listen to them, and then you kind of find your fierceness. I want to thank all three of you for this incredible panel, your inspiring insights. We have a picture to take before we move on to our next panel. 
All right, as our focus on National Women's History Month continues, we turn our attention to the political arena and are so fortunate to have with us two exceptional women in this field. I had the honor of interviewing our first panelist a couple of years ago, and I will never forget it, because there's just something about her, and her passion and her energy are contagious. She is a lion for this city. She's a voice for women and girls in Cambridge and a warrior for anyone else whose voice has been silenced. And you know what? She's also the conscience of many citizens who just need a push in the right direction. She has devoted 36 years of her life to public service. And in this second term as mayor, she will relaunch the Cambridge Girls Leadership Group and is working tirelessly for the establishment of the Cambridge Museum. The door to her office is always open, and the people of Cambridge have the confidence to march right in, and they know that they will be heard. Please welcome eight-time city council member and two-time Cambridge mayor, E. Denise Simmons. Come on up. Please be seated. Our second panelist is proud to say that this is her city too. Raised in Cambridge City Housing and the first in her family, female or male, to graduate from college or attend high school. Uh, from UMass Amherst and her master's at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, she has received an incredible education. She served for 14 years on the Cambridge City Council and is the first and only woman to give birth while serving on the council. <laughs> Elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 2012, she has been a tireless advocate for her community and for the rights of the homeless, for funding early education, for the protection of privacy, and is the leader on both transportation infrastructure and climate change. Like the Alicia Keys song, this girl is on fire. Please welcome State Rep Marjorie Decker. Okay, ladies, so I'll say the same thing I said to our first panel, which is uh, let's try to keep our answers to about two or three minutes, if you possibly can. You know we're politicians. Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> which is why I renewed that whole <laughs> warning one more time. Okay, Mayor Simmons. Yes. This is a historic, great city. What are you most proud of, and what is yet to be done? Well, to, to talk in very current terms, I'm very proud that this city, and I, my colleagues are here and stood up and did this, former counselor and vice mayor Decker and now state representative stood up for this. The fact that we maintain ourselves as a sanctuary city, that we look out for our citizens. That is my most proud moment or thing that we do. Representative Decker, this is a historic time in American politics. As you sit with your colleagues on Beacon Hill, what is your goal? How do you make your voice heard? Big question small time. Um, I think a couple of things. It's one to always, it's always the same goal, to make sure that the most vulnerable in our communities and for me throughout the Commonwealth have a voice, um, that we're not passing policies that cause harm but actually create strength and justice and equity. And recently I was appointed to a seven member um, working group committee by the speaker to uh, take deep dives into the Trump's administration's policies and look at their impact on Massachusetts and to work with coming up with recommendations about how to ensure that, again, our citizens, our citizens are not being harmed um, by this. I believe, as we talked about with panel number one, that obstacles really are opportunities, but it's about how you get around them. So, Mayor, when an obstacle is in your path, how do you get around it? What's your philosophy? Well, you know, I, I just had my henna done, and it says, nevertheless, she persisted. And it's really about persisting. You know, I came to elected office by way, of course, of an election. So in 1989, I ran for school committee. And as you can know, I ran and I... You won. Lost. <laughs> <laughs> But, but she persisted. But I persisted, and I ran again. And this is audience response. I ran and I, <laughs> I lost. <laughs> but I persisted, and I did run for a third time, and I, I 
Why? And I won. And, and it's really about not being daunted. It's not always easy for women. They have not been, it's far better now, clear pathways to opportunity to, a, to a success. There's no playbook. We often have to make it up on our own. And so I was not daunted by that. I turned that failure into an opportunity, that barrier into a instead of you said you know like what those barriers or those boundaries and taking that and saying i'm going to step over it go around it go under it go over it but i'm going to through it sometimes smash through it until yeah. i get what i am looking for or trying to achieve knowing that some other young lady some young woman is going to see that and know that she can do it as well and your answer obstacles how do you get around them you know, I, I think Mayor Simmons and I have um, a lot in common. We, we both grew up in Cambridge. We both grew up in families or in a time and situations in which we were just born into obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, for me, having grown up with two parents, neither who had graduated from high school or one with elementary school, growing up in public housing, um, the statistics are there. I wasn't supposed to succeed. I wasn't supposed to do well in school. I certainly wasn't supposed to be able to stand on my own two feet. And so I, I think that for me, and, and I think I speak for the mayor, that we thrive on obstacles because the idea of being told that I'm not supposed to move forward um, or to set my eyes on a goal, um, that is only, that's, it's a gift. It's a gift to have um, been born into circumstances where doubt is all around you. How people look at you, how they treat you, how they talk to your parents, what they expect of you, more importantly, what they don't expect of you. Um, and so um, to be able to sit here before this community of people that I love as the state representative and someone who's graduated from the Kennedy School with, with a master's degree, um, none of that was supposed to happen, but it all fuels why I do what I do, and it's about connecting with people who um, come from similar circumstances, knowing that circumstances alone should not prohibit or be um, the boundaries that stop you from moving forward. And if I may, just add to that, sure. we, both of us, I don't know why we did it, but we chose a profession that historically has been male-oriented. And so women would actually come up to us and to me and say, why do you want to do that? Why don't you, why don't you be a secretary? Because I can't type, you know? <laughs> but, but it was interesting how even our own peers wouldn't push us forward. And finally, it is National History Month, and Women's National History Month, and I keep coming across this one line. Our history is our strength. What is your message to the next generation of women who will stand on your shoulders? Well, I'm glad my daughter's not here because she says she gets tired of hearing this. But I always say, hold fast to your dreams and keep a secret spot where dreams can go can thrive and grow where doubt and fear are not. And it's basically a message that you kind of, a mantra to say, you just hope, set that goal for yourself. And even though you may have to take a detour, continue to push forward. Representative Decker? I just love sitting here with her. So. <laughs> She's very, you're both Soaking very up. inspiring. Let's hear it for these two, yes. by the way. And I am going to just take a second to say, I'm so excited to be sitting here with Candy O. Oh, oh, so this is really cool. Um, I, I will just say that I think the message is, is to really know who you are and to surround yourself with people who love you, who believe in you. Mm -hmm. um, if I had been surrounded by people, and it could have easily happened, and it happens to a lot of people who either don't look like me or aren't able to talk the way I do, um, I was surrounded by people who believed in me, who saw what I couldn't see in me just yet, what I had hoped might be there. But it was really having um, people in my life from a very young age who believed in me, who encouraged, who were just positive about who I was in this world. And that's who you hold on tight to. And then I was talking to a friend of mine who was in politics. He comes from um, a Latino family. And he also, against the odds, was able to serve. And we, taught, we, we found what we had in common is that we actually put up these blinders unknowingly and let all that noise and all that distraction about who we weren't supposed to be in the world, it, it just really, I kind of bulldozed through that and it, it didn't phase me and I didn't always realize that I wasn't supposed to be who I was. And those blinders are really important. Um, at the same time, being with people who believe in you and encourage you and can hold you when sometimes you begin to doubt um, your own abilities. Finally, 
Are you fierce? Yes. Absolutely, and when I'm not fierce, I fake it. <laughs> are you fierce? Yes. 24-7? You know we are fierce women, and people who know us on the council are fierce, and I just, because this is Women's History Month, it is really important to note that being fierce as a woman is also a liability sometimes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The way that I'm I have asking. been viewed in my advocacy and the mayor has been viewed in her advocacy has been judged very differently by men who are as fierce as we are. And you can just start thinking about the words that have been used to describe the both of us over the last 20 plus years. Which we will not repeat here. I will not repeat. She knows me well. Now, what I also have had to learn to do, and it took some life lesson and life experience to be comfortable in being fierce. And what I have turned to people and said is, okay, so you think I'm rough on the edges, you think I'm this, you think I'm that, I'm not saying those words. But at the end of the day, if you're in trouble, who do you want fighting for you? And I promise you that Mayor Simmons and myself are two of the people that will come to mind. Let's hear it for these two incredible, exceptional women. The mayor put together a group of fierce, and I will say fierce women, and I was so humbled to be in this room with them. And um, they began to talk about pay equity. And this was several months ago. And we met over a period of, I don't know, 12 or 14 weeks. And um, we decided that this law that Massachusetts, that, that Representative Decker helped pass, the, the Massachusetts pay equity law, which by the way, does not go into effect until July of 2018. And there were many of us that sat around one cold winter night in the mayor's office when it was dark and snowy and freezing, and we were drinking really bad coffee probably, and we said, why wait? Why should we wait? So the mayor said, well, let's not wait any longer. So she put together the concept of early adopters. And these were businesses in Cambridge that we reached out to, all businesses that we reached out to, and many of them responded and said, you know what, we're not going to wait. We're going to embrace the idea of pay equality, pay equity. And not just for women, but for minority men and, and minority women who are not treated equally. They're not. So with that, I would like to introduce Virginia. Hi, it's wonderful to be with all of you today. I know many of you know me, I'm Victoria Budson, and I lead the Women's Policy Center over at Harvard. And let me share with you why this is so important. Sometimes when you get it right, you're not getting it right just for your own community. Here in Massachusetts, at a time when the nation, of course, is robustly divided, we did something special. Not only did we do the right thing for women and the right thing for businesses, but what we did was give an example of bipartisan support led by colleagues like Marjorie Decker, who ensured that it's not just that it passed, which would have been enough. It passed unanimously. Every single member, regardless of party, understood what's good for women is good for the Commonwealth. When we look across the nation, women in Massachusetts are the most highly educated, the most. Yet, we continue to have a pay gap. Nationally, women make roughly 80 cents on the dollar compared to men. The bill that we passed does four critically important things to helping close that wage gap. So the first is you can no longer ask a prospective employee what their salary is at their current state of employment or any place they've worked before. So you don't get the snowball effect. We know from good research that women graduate to a pay gap. You can't inoculate yourself through education. And that matters extra here because we are the most educated women in the country, as I said, and the gap widens with the more education you have. Because when people have discretion and how they pay someone, both women and men underpay women. The second thing that this bill does is it says you have to pay men and women equally for comparable work. You can still pay people a different amount based on education, seniority, travel, performance. So businesses continue to have all of those tools for merit-based and other systems. However, we did something incredible for businesses. In the past, if you did an internal wage audit to make sure you're paying men and women differently, that information was discoverable. 
if one went into a legal proceeding. Now we have what's called an affirmative defense. Any business that moves forward and does an internal wage audit is then able to spend three years where they're protected for having done so as long as they've taken meaningful steps to solve the problem. And this matters not just because it gives businesses new tools, but it sets the right frame. We are all in this together, and the goal is to get it right. Because getting it right is good for business, it's good for families and communities, and it's good for the Commonwealth. Women spend more of their dollars on Main Street. It helps to grow businesses. Women begin more entrepreneurship-based businesses than men. Having dollars in women's pockets helps ensure that the Commonwealth has a strong economy. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mayor Simmons. So like my name say, said, Denise Gilson, we have been working over a number of months on this idea of pay equity. And when we started, it, it, we were kind of going in the dark. We knew it was something that we wanted to do, because this is what we do in Cambridge. We are proactive, not reactive. And we knew, and I've had the opportunity of do, knowing this and doing this work, because we've done it around issues of housing. You know, there was, there's no one that has been more fierce than Representative Decker when she was on the city council and still in the state, or, my, or Mark McGovern or Jan Dever. We've always tried to say, where's the problem? And let's fix it. Let's not wait for a tragedy or an incident to do that work. And so I called together a, a number of women and men to say, let's look at this. And let me just pause for a moment. And if the members of the Pay Equity Committee are here, if you could just put your hand up so we can see who you are. These women and these men came together over a number of months, came, and came early, stayed late, as we looked at the law that goes into effect, as Victoria said, in July of 2018. But the job was, why wait? Why wait? Women who have been waiting far too long to be paid for the paid the right amount, a fair amount for the work that they have done, have been waiting how long? Too long. Too long. How long? Too, Too long. long. And so, why should we, the city of Cambridge, who has been always proactive, always out in the front, wait to 2018 to say, we should do the right thing? Let's do the right thing now. And so I'm really proud and pleased to be able to say, to announce, but I'm going to hold my announcement just because I want to let my colleague from the state talk a little bit about the work and how it came to us, and then I'll come back. So, Representative Decker, Thank please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't, I don't think I have much more to add than both of you have already said. It's just that it's exciting to not only have been a part of seeing this legislation finally come to fruition, but to now also know that I'm living in a community where the mayor and others have come together and, and members of the business community have come together to say, we're going to once again model for the rest of the state what good government looks like, what good public policy looks like, how it actually benefits and helps families. I'm, I'm just so excited that Cambridge is going to be the city to show others you don't have to wait to 2018. You can do this right now. And in fact, as Victoria said, Women are the ones who are out there shopping. We are the primary consumers for our families. And when we have more money in our pockets, we in fact are spending that money right back, pouring it right back into our local businesses. Um, so I want to say thank you for both of you and for all of you, and for Denise and for all of you who've been on that committee for having the foresight, as you do, right? This is who we are in Cambridge, but you've, you've, you're doing it. Thank you for coming together and looking at an opportunity for us to actually move forward um, before the state law requires us to do that. Victoria, a few more words. What's very interesting is at a time where we see citizens all over the United States not just sharing opinion on social media, but literally taking to the streets, over really five years, a system of women's commissions was built across the state. We worked with political leaders, whether that was Marjorie Decker or other colleagues in the House and Senate, or Denise Simmons here, who provided real leadership we worked with business leaders. The Boston Chamber of Commerce was in full support of the bill. I'm here working in academia, that we were able to take all of the strengths, the business community, our public leaders, the academic community, 
We have the major health systems involved in this effort as well. All of the strengths of the Commonwealth to work together to solve a problem. And in most places, you think of leaders and advocates, the business community, the women's community. Here we integrate it. And to really put a fine point on it as well, once this was passed, the, the work done by the city of Boston under leadership there, this is now being taken across the country and, and beyond. I'll be going up to Canada shortly to be working with their pay equity team to understand what it is we've done here. You've seen an executive order come out from the governor of New York based on what we did here. You've seen the mayor of Washington, D.C. work on it based on what we've done here. And I could go on and on, but note, when you take action, when you raise your voice, when you call your representative, what we're doing here isn't just helping us, but it is literally being used as a model. I don't expect this legislation to go anywhere federally anytime soon, but it has been filed federally as well. So what we've been able to accomplish is truly the beacon the way Massachusetts has always been. We have the longest still in use constitution and what Mayor Simmons has provided for leadership, having Cambridge not wait, figuring out how to solve the problem, working with all the facets of the city, it truly is model governance. Thank you. So, thank you, Victoria. Just a, a, a few thank yous. I have to say a thank you, thank you, thank you to Victoria because she really helped us provide a pathway and a direction to make sure we were going in the right direction in terms of making this happen. I also want to acknowledge and thank someone who's very shy and doesn't want to take any credit for anything. Where's Teresa Stevens from my office? Teresa, where are you? Teresa. She made the phone calls. We work as a very large committee, but we also work as a subcommittees to look at best practices. How do we provide pathways to progress for pathways to parity for, for women, not only in the municipality, but for any other of the organizations that sign on. So I just wanted to take a very special thanks to her. I want to also acknowledge Mark. Mark McGovern has been really helpful because when I have to be in my pay equity committee, he would say, okay, I'll take care of this other thing for you. So he's been a great supporter. Thank you so much, Mark, for your work. And as I think, and then I'll move down to the ta-da moment, Representative, I miss you on the council, but I thank you for doing the work that you do because it had to start somewhere. And she is fierce, and so I, if, I, if I need someone to have my back, this is where I go because she carries, she really does, and this is a sports metaphor, and I'm not good at these, but she's the woman that gets the ball down the court. So thank you. All right, so as we were talking, um, we, we said that in order to do this work, you have to have this concept, this mechanism called a dashboard. So Candy, I know you said tearing off the cell phones, but now I want you to take your cell phones out And I want you to go to cambridgema.gov backslash equal pay. Because at this very moment, the city of Cambridge has, lost, it has launched its diversity dashboard. So please, let's give a round of applause for this very hard work. As you will see, as you will see, when this dashboard will give us the information so that we can look to see where the disparities are. And then we can, through our committee work that we are gonna design, provide ways that we can close those gaps. Now this was a real coordinated effort. It was from the women from all across the city, but we met, and, and city departments. So I do have to take a moment to acknowledge and thank two extraordinary people. Lisa Peterson, who's our assistant city manager who sits on the committee, but where's Louis De Pasquale? Where is he? Is he here? Louis? Are you? Come on over. Louis De Pasquale has made this work possible, gave us our committee the resources in order to be able to launch this dashboard. So Louis, I just want to say thank you. Please say <laughs> We do let men talk. Go ahead. Thank you. I really didn't come here to speak, but I will just say that, you know, when Denise and Marjorie put their heads together, everybody better look out because they're going to get it done. And when they said they wanted to do this, it's exciting because it's the right thing to do. 
why it's taken so long to address issues like this, why it's taking so long to get it right is amazing. But we can get it right in Cambridge. We do things right. So I want to thank Denise. I want to thank Marjorie. I want to thank everybody in the committee. Because one thing I've always said about Cambridge is city government can't do it alone. But when we work with the business community, we work with the institutions, it's one of the reasons why Cambridge is special, because it's a team place. And obviously, we work with the residents. And we always try to listen. So I think when you put that all together, that's a successful formula. So to everybody here, Lee Gianetti also from the manager's office, but for everybody here who took part of this, I just want to say from my point of view, thank you, because we will get it right. I can promise you that, especially with these two leading the charge. So thank you. And thank you, Mr. D. And th I'm glad that you acknowledged um, Lee Gianetti and Elijah Della Camp Campa. They actually built, they took the raw data and built the dashboard. So I want to say thank you to them. We were, the city of Cambridge, very proactive. We, did, we said we are not going to wait till July 2018 to see if we're getting it right. We, we're not going to wait for 2018 to say, let's get started. We didn't mm -hmm. say we're going to, we said we were not going to look for 2018 to say, let's work on a plan. We wanted to do it now, and so we're well on our way. But we didn't go alone. We have early adopters, businesses, and institutions across the city of Cambridge that says, if you're going to do it, if you're going to go with this, we're going to go with you. And so I would like to read this proclamation and acknowledge what we call early adopters, business, businesses across the city who have said, we will look at wage equity in our institution, in our organization. And so let me um, read the proclamation, and then I'm going to ask some of our early adopters that are here to come forward. And it reads as follows. Whereas equal pay for equal work and the gender wage gap remains issues of natural, national interest and importance with consequences felt locally in cities and towns across the country, including progressive cities like Cambridge. And whereas on average women still earn approximately 82 cents on the dollar compared to men and the wage gap is even bigger for women of color earning 61 cents on the dollar and Latina women who are earning 54 cents on the dollar. And whereas the following local employers have taken the lead on closing the gender gap by paying, by beginning early adopters of equal pay and they are, I'm so impressed with this list, the following, Bookkeeping Plus and more, Bone Me Foods, Cambridge Ellis School, Cambridge Housing Authority, Cambridge Naturals, Cambridge Trust Company, Eastern Bank, and Root Education, Flower Bakery and Cafe, Food for Free Committee, GQS Management Incorporated, Harvard Bookstore, Irving House at Harvard, at Harvard and Harding, LDA Architecture and Interiors, LLP, Miller Haven Art, Porter Square Books, Salt and Olive, The Big Skinny, The Dance Complex, The Middle East, The Williams Agency, Trademark Art Tours, Transition House, Union of Concerned Scientists, Windsor House Adult Day, Healthcare Center, ZA, and Evu Restaurants in Zenikins, all are early adopters. This was tremendous. And whereas the Cambridge employees knew that Massachusetts Act to Establish Pay Equity Law would not go into effect until July 2018, but were inspired, inspired to act now to make a difference in the lives of women and families, not tomorrow, but today. And be, by becoming an equal adopter of equal pay, these employers have shown a commitment to making Cambridge community a better place for working women and toward vesting in economic equalities. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I am very happy. That's what it basically says. I am very happy. I am very happy. But I want to go on record on, on behalf of the entire city by formally re thanking them the 27 Cambridge employers for their leadership in being proactive early adopters of pay equity. And I see Candy here. I just am wondering if anyone has any questions for, for the mayor or anyone up here in regards to this incredible new announcement. Anyone? Questions. All right. This, we, is, a, this is a historic moment. For, the city of for a couple of reasons, no questions. But. <laughs> If you do, if, the, if you want more information about what we're doing, please call the Office of the Mayor, and Teresa Stevens is our contact person for our Pay Equity Committee. Are any of the early adopters here? Can you come forward? Early adopters, please come forward.
Come around, come on around. This is what progressive activism looks like. These are individuals that, that's, that said when asked, call me, I'll come, I'll do the work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are not just role models, you are real models of what the work that has to be done that needs to be done, so please, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, not just for the work that you're gonna do with us, but for the women whose lives and the family's lives that you're going to touch, children that you may never see, women you may never meet, are going to benefit from the work that we're gonna do here. So thank you so very much. So as we close out, if I can bring Denise and Louis here, we wanna take a couple of pictures and then of all the early adopters, and then I want the committee to join us as well. But before we um, do all of that, I wanna say to each of you and all of you that are here, thank you so much for your support for coming out to this event. Thank you for Denise and the Harvard Square Business Association, John D. Giovanni. I think John D. Giovanni's here as well for all their hard work and their support. So thank you, thank you again. Denise, do you wanna say something? Where's Denise, please? Well, we did this, um, but one thing we didn't do is we didn't, I in, didn't properly introduce this extraordinary woman. Please take a minute and tell us who you are, because she's amazing, and it, it, it's really important that you all know the work that she's doing. Please. Denise, thank you. Well, I have the privilege of working on these types of issues to close gaps every day. One of my colleagues, Chelsea Villarreal, is with me today, who's my right hand, makes it all happen. And what we're doing at Harvard is we are literally taking the idea of equality and turning it into the practices of equality. You, if you haven't heard of the Women in Public Policy program, you'll have heard of what we've done. The World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Report, for example, we built the metrics for that. We have been focused on designing the interventions that companies and organizations can actually use to close it. Most leaders want to close the gender gap, they just don't know how. So we figure out the hows and have been applying that work. I've worked very closely with the Obama administration. We work with major businesses and corporations. And we work with governments all over the world to help figure out how to do it. In Australia right now, the state of Victoria, for example, is implementing virtually all of the work that our center has been doing and trying it out. And then we measure it and test it and do it better. Because what we know is any gap that we can measure we can close. And the work that everyone in this room has done together in creating the dashboard means we now have measures. And once we can understand where the gaps are, we can build all of the tools to help each and every person, regardless of the lottery of their birth, live the best life that they can. Thanks so much. Thank you, Victoria. That's Victoria Budson. And we're going to give Candy O'Terry our fabulous moderator, the very last word. And um, before I hand it over, I just want to thank all of you for coming. We're going to do this again next year, right? Awesome. A absolutely. Is this mic live? Check, check. OK. Hey, it's been done. This is a huge accomplishment for the city of Cambridge and Boston Women in Media and Entertainment. We're so pleased to collaborate with the Harvard Square Business Association. We hope we're getting you back to work on time. And we thank you so much for your attention today. Have the best day ever. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's yeah, a good idea. That's and, a and great away idea. from the heat, too. We'll go in front. Right.